Hello everyone, and welcome back to our reading of Sasquatch, True Life Encounters with Legendary Ape Men, or at least uh, my copy says Sasquatch. <clears throat> Today's chapter, Orang Pendek. Let's get started. The Short Man Somewhere in the mountainous forests of southern Sumatra is said to live the Orang Pendek, the Short Man. The local villagers of the more densely forested regions appear to take the creature for granted, much as they do the tiger and the rhinoceros, which, although rare, frequent these woods. When told that western scientists do not recognize the orang pendek as a real creature, the locons are inclined to scoff. The first reference to this creature to be written by an outsider was made in 1917, by a Dr. Edward Jacobson. The good doctor wrote about the creature in a scientific journal published in the Netherlands, Sumatra Lin being part of the Dutch colonial empire. Jacobson said that he had been camped near Bokit Kaba when the local men he had hired to hunt meat for him came strolling in to announce that he had just passed an orang pendek and had been looking for insect larvae in a fallen log. They said that the creature had run off when it had seen them, and when questioned, insisted that it did so on its hind legs. Jacobson thought this odd, because the only apes he knew of, gibbons and orangutans, would have swung off through the trees. He went to investigate and found a footprint that looked exactly like that of a human, except that it was very small. Jacobson's letter prompted a separate report from another European living in Sumatra, Elm C. Westerneck. Westerneck reported that a friend of his had been leading a gang of workmen into the forest near Lobeck Salisic to cut timber when they came across what he described as a large creature, low on its feet, which ran like a man and was about to cross the path. It was very hairy and was not an orangutan. Its face was not like an ordinary man's. It silently and gravely gave the men a disagreeable stare and ran calmly away. The workmen ran faster in the opposite direction. Also joining in the correspondence was a Mr. Oosting, the manager of a coffee plantation at the Tarin, who in 1917 had managed to get lost in the forest. He emerged into a clearing to discover what he took to be a man sitting with his back to him. I saw that he had short hair. Cut short, I thought, and I suddenly realized that his neck was oddly leathery and extremely filthy. That chap's got a very dirty and wrinkled neck, I said to myself. His body was as large as a medium-sized native's. And he had thick, square shoulders, not sloping at all. The color was not brown, but looked like black earth, a sort of dusty black, more gray than black. He clearly noticed my presence. He did not so much as turn his head, but stood up on his feet. He seemed to be quite as tall as I am, five feet nine inches. Then I saw that it was not a man, and I started back for I was not armed. The creature calmly took several paces without the least haste, and then with his ludicrously long arm, grasped a sapling which threatened to break under his weight, and quietly sprang into a tree, swinging in great leaps alternately to right and to left. It was not an orangutan. I had seen one of these large apes a short time before. It was more like a monstrously large Siamang, but a Siamang has long hair, and there was no doubt that it had short hair. I did not see its face, for it never once looked at me. Further Sightings It has been suggested that what Oosting saw was, in fact, a very large Siamang. The average height for these animals is about three feet, but old males are known to grow rather larger. This would certainly fit the description of the creature swinging off through the trees. 
other reports of the orang pendek usually say that it runs off on the ground. Mr. Cummins, a railway manager, continued the correspondence when he wrote of an incident near his station at Ben Colen. Footprints of pygmies were found. They were like a child's footprints but broader. Later the same prints were found near Sungai Klombok. Along this creature's path the stones had been turned over here and there as though it was looking for food beneath them. It was a farmer named Van Herwarden who produced the clearest of these early reports. He was out hunting wild pigs when he saw something unusual sitting in a tree. My first quick look revealed nothing, but after walking round the tree again, I discovered a dark and hairy creature on a branch. The front of its body was pressed tightly against the tree. It looked as if it were trying to make itself inconspicuous, and felt that it was about to be discovered. I laid my gun on the ground and tried to get nearer the animal. I had hardly climbed three or four feet into the tree when the body above me began to move. The creature lifted itself a little from the branch and leaned over the side so that I could then see its hair, its forehead, and a pair of eyes which stared at me. Its movements had at first been slow and cautious, but as soon as the thing saw me, the whole situation changed. It became nervous and trembled all over. In order to see it better, I slid down onto the ground. The beast was also hairy on the front of its body. The color there was a little lighter than on the back. The very dark hair on its head fell to just below the shoulder blades, or even almost to the waist. It was fairly thick and very shaggy. The lower part of its face seemed to end in more of a point than a man's. This brown face was almost hairless, while the forehead seemed to be high rather than low. Its eyebrows were the same color as its hair, and were very bushy. The eyes were frankly moving. They were the darkest color, very lively and like human eyes. The nose was broad, with fairly large nostrils, but in no way clumsy. It reminded me a little of a negro's. Its lips were quite ordinary, but the width of its mouth was strikingly wide when open. Its canines showed clearly from time to time as its mouth twitched nervously. They seemed fairly large to me. At all events they were more developed than a man's. The incisors were regular. The color of the teeth was yellowish white. The chin was somewhat receding. For a moment I was able to see its right ear which was exactly like a little human ear. Its hands were slightly hairy on the back. Had it been standing, its arms would have reached a little above its knees. They were long, but its legs seemed to me rather short. I did not see its feet, but I did see some toes, which were shaped in a very normal manner. This specimen was of the female sex, and about five feet in height. There was nothing repulsive or ugly about the face, nor was it at all ape-like, although the quick nervous movements of its eyes and mouth were very like those of a monkey in distress. I began to talk in a calm and friendly way to the beast, as if I were soothing a frightened dog or horse, but it did not make much difference. When I raised my gun, I heard a plaintive hoo hoo, which was at once answered by similar calls from the forest nearby. I laid my gun on the ground and climbed into the tree again. The beast ran very fast along a branch, then dropped ten feet to the ground. By the time I reached my gun, it was thirty yards away and running fast, giving a sort of wrestle. Many people may think me childish if I say that when I saw its flying hair in the sights, I did not pull the trigger. I suddenly felt 
that I was going to commit murder. Crushing Disappointment In 1932, native hunters presented what they said was the body of a young Orang Pendek to the Sumatran newspaper, the Delhi Courant, in return for the reward that the newspaper had offered for the proof of the creature's existence. The newspaper gleefully printed the story of the mystery animal's arrival, its appearance, its condition, and the fact that it was being sent to Dr. Dammerman of the Zoological Museum at Butenzorg for study. When the report came back, it was a crushing disappointment. The supposed Orang Pendex juvenile was simply a hoax. A fully grown Langer monkey had been shot, then had its fur trimmed to match the usual description of an Orang Pendex hair. The nose had been stretched with a piece of wood, the teeth fired to shape, and the cheekbones carefully fractured to alter their shape. All of this had a most unfortunate effect. The Dutch colonial authorities lost all interest in this supposed rare member of Sumatra's fauna, and the whole thing became something of a joke. Anyone who mentioned this subject was treated as a fool and subjected to ridicule, rather as if they had declared that they had seen Father Christmas passing by in his flying sleigh. In 1941, the island was invaded by the Japanese, then liberated in 1945, and finally returned to Dutch rule before, in 1947, joining the newly independent state of Indonesia. The whole subject of the strange, human-like ape in the southern forests got forgotten, except by the local people, who claimed to have come across it frequently. Then, in July 1989, a British reporter named Debra Martyr went to Sumatra to produce some travel features. While there, she went up to the Mount Kernesi area of the dense, largely unexplored rainforest to seek out animals to photograph. Her guide, a man named Jam Rudin, was asked where they had to travel to see the different animals. He began by explaining where to see tigers and where they would travel to see rhinoceros and other creatures. Then, quite casually, he pointed to the area of land east of Mount Tuju and remarked that if they had more time, they could go there to see a ring paint deck. But that there was not really time, and in any case, the creatures were rare and very shy. A type of gibbon? At the time Martyr did not know about the earlier reports, I thought that Jem Rudin was using a local name for a type of gibbon. Gradually, she realized that he and others who said that they had met the orang pendek were referring to something very different from the gibbons or orangutans, with which she was familiar. Back in London, Martyr researched the term and discovered the orang pendek was a cryptid ape, supposed to be rather human-like, but that there was no hard evidence to support its existence. Realizing that the local villagers she had spoken to considered the creature to be very real indeed, and not at all unusual, Mortar went straight back to search for the orang pendek. She has been on the trail of the elusive animal ever since, visiting Sumatra when she can take time off from her work to do so. What is known of this cryptid is largely due to her work. In 1999, Debbie Martyr was rewarded for her persistence by a sighting of what she described as a bipedal half-ape, half-given-looking orang pendek. In 2003, two new researchers, Adam Davies and Andrew Sanderson, found hairs and made a cast of a footprint. These were sent to Cambridge University for study. Examination of the footprint cast revealed that it came from an ape that had features of both the human and chimpanzee foot, but that the cast matched no known primate. The hairs were studied by the Australian specialist Dr. Hans Bruner. He concluded that they were from a primate, but he could not assign them to any known species. 
Len, in 2005, the National Geographic Society set up a project in the Mount Tanisi region, based on the use of camera traps. These are cameras that are operated when something moves within their field of vision. To date, however, nothing definitive has been photographed. It seems that the orang pendek was formerly widely distributed over the rainforest-covered hills of southern Sumatra. The island covers almost 200,000 square miles, and even today there are large stretches of virgin forest. However, the growth of the oil and timber industries has meant that there is an increasingly complex network of roads through the interior. Also, men are now hunting for sport or food, so they are pushing into many areas that were previously utterly remote. The Orang Pendek does not seem to welcome such an intrusion by human outsiders and is now reported from an increasingly smaller area. By the 1990s, reported encounters were coming only from an area between Banco and Mount Karanisi. This is a stretch of untouched rainforest many hundreds of square miles in extent. It is big, but nowhere near as large as the area of forest that is no longer untouched. The Orang Pendek is said by those who have seen it to look like a short human, hence its name, though with some clear differences. For a start, it has a light covering of dark fur that is thicker on the limbs than on the body. The top of the head carries a mane of much longer hair that grows down the back at least as far as the shoulder blades and perhaps to the waist. Its forehead is high and its ears are like those of a human, while the body is stocky and muscular, with a prominent pot belly. Coming to the limbs, its arms are a bit longer than those of a human, but not so elongated as are those of the gibbons, and its legs are like those of a human. The creature walks on its hind legs alone, and the few footprints that have been found and cast in plaster show that its foot is very like that of a human. In fact, it has an arch and five toes arranged along the front edge. In size, the footprints are about the same as those made by a seven or eight year old human child, but rather wider at the front and with a very robust ball joint behind the big toe. Dawn and dusk are the times at which the creatures seem to be active, at least that is when they are seen raiding the fields for sugarcane, bananas and other food crops. The creatures are usually seen alone, though sometimes a mother and her young will be in the same group. Only very rarely are two adults seen together. However, when one of them calls, they are sometimes answered by another creature that is hidden in the undergrowth and tree foliage. There the matter rests. There have been no official or even semi-official attempts to find the Orang Pendek. When Martyr tried to interest the director of the Karanisi National Park, which covers four million acres of virgin rainforest, she was met by frank disbelief. He knew all about the stories, but did not believe them because the local people were simple and uneducated. And uh, that's the chapter. Uh, I again apologize for saying the word Negro, but again it's in the text and the man was uh, from what, the 1910s, 1920s? Yeah, he was from that point of time. And, uh, simple and uneducated. Hmm. I wonder how many people ended up eating those words when it was proven the gorilla actually existed. Anyway, that's all for today. I'll see you all next time. See ya!